Buster. Buster Scruggs. You're shooting iron work. Appears to do, yes. I <laughs> did get to do that. Only with the Coen brothers would yours truly be playing a title role. He's a an Old West uh, pistol trickster and troubadour who lives by a very strict code. And you don't want to cross him. I had just done Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And, and Joel said, we've got this idea of doing an anthology movie of Westerns, and we've written the first one, and we want you to play this character. And he's going to be the title character, but he'll be in the first of these, what will be four or five segments. And his name is Buster Scruggs. And rather than describe it, I'm just going to give you the script. And so he walked over to my apartment. We were neighbors at that point and handed it to me and uh i read it incredulously and um and then uh he said well it's gonna take us a while we've got to write the rest of them and 15 years later uh he said okay we've got them all done and we're gonna we're gonna do this well that's it boys i've been redeemed the preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions it's a straight and narrow from here on out. Unbelievably, I didn't even audition for that role, and I couldn't have been more obscure as an actor. So I was a, a, a burgeoning filmmaker at that point, and they'd seen my first film, but also we had begun to interact, my wife and I, socially with Fran and Joel and had become friends, and they had this role and decided to, to offer it to me. They're kind of oxymoronic in their approach because they're so unbelievably controlling and meticulous in all the best ways. And yet at the same time, you never feel more liberated as an actor than when you're on one of their sets. You you really can try anything, take any risk without fear of castigation if you fail. And that's a rare combination to have that level of freedom and space around you really to, to try stuff out and yet at the same time be in the hands of filmmakers who are so careful and meticulous. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when Joel offered me, oh brother, I had the temerity to say, well, I've got to sleep on it. And the reason I did that is I just didn't want to show up on their set and fail. I didn't want to disappoint them because Joel had had this capricious impulse to give an unknown actor one of the leads in a Coen Brothers movie. Now though, Having been given Buster Scruggs uh, uh, and, and, and knowing them, I just thought, well, yeah, this is in many ways as challenging a role as I've ever played with so much to do, technically. But I've got to trust that if they wanted me to do it, that I can do it. <laughs> Did you hear that? Greasy. Nice compliment, eh, Rodney? Word. I thought you were smushed for sure. So that was really early in my career. Mm -hmm. I think that was in about 1991, is my guess, maybe 90. And I had fallen in. I was doing street theater in New York when I was in acting school. My partner and I would we, we would do these improvisations on the street, and we sat there on this rectangle of astroturf in lawn chairs with polyester suits and smoked cigars and we talked about our lives. And what was interesting about our lives is that we seem to have been alive since before history. And we were hicks. And so we would say, I was hanging out with, um, this was in uh, 1884, and I was in Berlin, and uh, I was in a bar with, this, uh, with Friedrich Nietzsche. And I busted a shot glass in his face, and that's why he had that mustache, was to cover over the scar. And, you know, we would just stupid stuff like that. Otto von Bismarck, he was a son of a bitch. Uh, but, man, he gave a good blowjob. You know, things like that. It was just ridiculously stupid. And so this producer, who ended up producing South Park, Debbie Liebling, brilliant comedy producer. She was working at MTV, and she dropped her card in our bucket. And she put us on television. We were just snotty kids from at drama school at Juilliard. And she just, we literally were on television on MTV. It probably wasn't even legal. I don't even think we signed contracts. And, you know, they maybe paid us $500 in cash or something. And so that got me into this whole world of weird 
stuff like Joe's Apartment, and I did this this show called Pirate Television that was on the air in the early cable days. And yeah, Joe's Apartment, again, I don't even think I was paid for that. I think the guy just said, come in, we're doing this movie, and it's this guy in, in living on the Lower East Side, and he shares his apartment with this army of, of marauding cockroaches, and they talk, and they talk with one another, and I think they talk with him. And so I went in and did all these voices. Probably I recorded that in the middle of the night in a sound stage that was probably a Foley stage for porn movies. She's a golden oldie, one of our first, probably before your time. I feel incredibly lucky to have gotten to work with Stephen twice. He has a keen sense as opposed to the Coen brothers, I think Stephen's color palette is truly infinite in terms of the actors whom he likes to use. And so, you know, you're a particular shade of red, and that might work for this movie. But if you're right for the next movie, he's going to look really, really hard to make sure that there's not a slightly darker shade of red that's going to be better for for the, the second movie. And so that I got to, to be the right shade for the right character twice in, on, on his canvas has been, I felt very, very lucky. The Secretary of State here tells me that uh, you got 11 Democrats in the bag. That's encouraging. Oh, you've got no cause to be encouraged, sir. Uh, are we being fired? So on Lincoln, as an example, nobody on the crew was allowed to wear shorts. Nobody was allowed to wear sneakers, no paper cups. So I'm a, an espresso drinker, and I had to get a period cup to have my espresso on set. Absolutely no phones, no cameras, except for the movie camera. And of course, you're to call Daniel Mr. President, and that includes Stephen. It's true that Obama wanted to come and visit the set, so Stephen had to go and say, Mr. President, the current occupant of your office would really like to come and watch the proceedings as we try to get this amendment passed. And the president said, I don't, I don't think that would be a good idea if we allowed that. It might just be a distraction, Skipper. The, the actor Hal Holbrook, yeah, great actor. Uh, who was in my first movie, it's a wonderful oh, guy. Yeah. I guess he hadn't gotten the memo we'd all gotten. And so on his first day working with the president, he said, Daniel, it's great to be working with you. I'm a big fan. And Stephen rushes over and says, sir, you do understand that this is the, the president of the United States. And, and the president would really not like for any other outside realities to be entering into the room. He's very anxious that that it just be kept to this time, and he's just speaking very carefully in clo in code to get the point across to Hal. Don't don't fucking address him as Daniel Day Lewis. And so Hal's nodding, and he says, "Okay, I I understand, sir. I understand." And then he turns to Daniel and he says, "But you were fucking great in that wheelchair movie." <laughs> You guys, you guys, I see one, I see a turkey. Shoot it, shoot it. Oh my God, you just shot the mountain man. You know, I love those guys. Yeah. Each funny in his own way. And that was a great moment when they, the, those three guys came together. And I did it because Edward, you know, my friend Edward Norton had done one. And I thought, well, all right. I don't know exactly who these guys are, but if Edward did one, well, I'm not going to say no. Uh, sure. And I'm mostly interested in working with people who have their own take on on what the world is all about and and it really is no one else's mm -hmm. and Stella certainly uh, fit into that category this will be a somewhat novel sensation we have begun I loved doing Hulk mm -hmm. and I also had a great time on Fantastic Four you know, and I'm, I'm and I'm proud to have been in both movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I liked Louis, and I liked Josh Trank. I mm -hmm. thought I loved Josh Trank. Um, I liked working with him a great deal. They were very different experiences, mm -hmm. you know, because it was earlier on, and Hulk was an early Marvel movie. I think that there was a little less pressure on Louis and Edward, whereas Fantastic Four 
was a reboot, and it's for reasons that I don't quite understand, maybe a more challenging transmogrification uh, into, into movie from, from comic book. Look, I know you're scared. You should be. But we can help you. You want to find a cure? We have resources here, the best in the world. We're analyzing what happened to you. But even that, you know, I both of them had their own peculiar, in a, in a good way, looks and approaches to the material. Watchmen really feels interesting because without giving too much away, and this certainly coheres with the original source material, we're not really superheroes. There's a vigilante component to it. And so I don't find myself acting with imaginary things flying through the air. And it's a bit more issue and humanity-based mm -hmm. than fantastical. Yes, there are fantastical aspects to it, like with Dr. Manhattan and to a degree Ozymandias, but it's we're really human beings. 